the damage and the danger is that the background level of information carrying radio waves has become so high that we can't escape it. And in this circumstance, all of us are being triggered with these information carrying radio waves. Now, whether or not it's going to become clinical depends on how well our bodies are able to respond, how, how robust we are, whether or not our doctors and others have been able to give us interventions. You know, there's a very interesting nanotechnology uh, called the molecular resonance effect technology. That's a primary intervention. It's, it's a polymer that's been designed uh, by the Russians. Uh, it's fractal geometry, fractal matrix. And what happens is, is that this polymer, in the presence of a one milligauss magnetic field, begins a process of systematic degradation. And when the molecules fall off, they go into a honeycomb that's part of the structure of the poly of polymer. And as they bounce around, they increase energy. When they get to a certain point, the energy is released as a wave, as a low energy wave. And because these honeycombs are sequential, what happens is, is that these little energy waves come out, and together they form a random wave. They attach to the information carrying radio wave and make the information carrier radio wave look incoherent to the vibrational proteins on the cell membrane so that the cell membrane receptor does not recognize the, in the information carrying radio wave. That's just one example. We call that a passive noise field. That's just one, one example of an intervention that is specific. Now, there are point of use interventions like that. But the big problem, and I'll be done in a second, the big problem is that the wireless infrastructure that we have is leading us to a point of no return. Because as more and more people are using cell phones, and as we have more and more people using Wi-Fi and WiMAX, and as we have absolutely ignorant, stupid experiments of putting Wi-Fis in schools, as we have them, the background level continues to rise. So that in terms of a primary intervention, the only solution that we see as a long-term intervention is eliminating most of the wireless infrastructure and replacing it with fiber optic infrastructure. Because if you're able to have a fiber optic spine, a fiber optic infrastructure, then what you're able to do is have nodes, a series of nodes that will be the wireless transmission uh, endpoint. And you can treat those with noise field. And what we're talking about is a mast that will have an antenna that can operate at 100 watts down to nodes that can transmit at 1 to 2 watts. And at 1 to 2 watts, the near field plume is very small and noise field can be applied at the point of transmission. Then, if you have noise field at the point of use, interventions on phones and um, uh, laptop computers and whatnot, you can solve the problem. So as we're out there talking about the, the big picture problem and the little picture problem, we always have to be able to give a solution. And the fact is there are solutions available. So there is no need and no reason for people to be victimized. Thank you. I'll give you a bottom line answer. No. Here's the issue. Under the age of 12, cells are differentiating more than they're growing. So that even though you might be able to attach a point of use intervention like a noise field, what happens is you have, very, you have vulnerable DNA and you have vulnerable cell mem membranes. And we don't know what happens with that vulnerability. So it is not something that you should be doing, especially when a cell phone has, the near field still has a very high concentration of information carrying radio waves. 
Now, if we get to a point where we have been able to alter the infrastructure so we have more fiber optics and less wireless, the answer might be different. But today, children under 12 should not be using cell phones. Are they not getting the radiation from all around them? They are getting the radiation from all around them, but when you put a cell phone next to them, the near field multiplies the amount of information carrying radio waves by factors of 10 to 100. So that it simply is reducing the concentration, and that's a, a, it's not a complete protection, but it is a, a precautionary recommendation. Yes. The base station, 196 meters from a children's school, age from 4 to 12, be a concern to you? Well, here's what the situation is with base stations. While uh, you know the industry might uh, give you other type data, these base stations usually have a directionality. In other words, they're usually pointing in a very specific direction. And uh, while uh, absent any excursions, which we know happen all the time, if they stay operating at 100 watts, for example, then you should have about a 300 to 400 foot near field plume from that, from that base station. However, what happens is, is that if, for example, we're pointing this signal all in one direction, that near field plume could be up to 1,000 feet. So that unless you are able to go in there and do the, the type of analysis that Dr. Oberfeld showed you, where you're able to actually see what the plume looks like and what the, what the makeup of the frequency dispersion is, really can't give you a, a, a specific answer. Here's the baseline. If they're information carrying radio waves, you're going to be triggering biological responses. If you have biological responses, you're going to have an impact on the children. One quick example, we just did a risk assessment in a community called Rancho Santa Fe in California. Rancho Santa Fe is the richest community in America. It has movie stars and professional athletes and a bunch of uh, aspiring young parents who feel that they all have the next Einstein. Well, that community has an elementary school and right next to the elementary school is a fire, fire hall with a base station on it. And we measure the near field plume to go way beyond the school. So in other words, you have information carrying radio waves coming into the school and the concentration of antennas has increased dramatically in the last four years on that base station. See, it's not just one antenna, it's, it's many. For the past 20 years up to 2002, that school was the number one elementary school in California. In 2003, it dropped to number seven. And in 2005, it dropped to number nine. This is based on performance tests, aptitude tests given to the students on a standardized basis across the state of California. Now, can we draw a direct correlation between the base station and the drop in performance of those kids? Uh, no, we didn't really do a study. But you know, isn't that a horrible canary in the coal mine? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Just one, one question. Okay, the, the near field is the plume that is the result of the burst of energy that is necessary to carry the signal to the base station. So it's, it's equivalent to, let's imagine that you have a pond and you have a stick in the pond and you want to, to push the stick to the other side of the pond and you flick it like this. When you flick it, that's a burst of energy and the weight that the, uh, the stick makes is really the near field plume. That's the equivalent of the near field plume. As the stick moves across, the weight dissipates. After you move, after the weight dissipates, what's left is the far field. The combination of the near field and the far field is the ambient. And that's what we're saying is rising to alarming levels. The ambient level, the combination of the near field and the far field in terms of the concentration of information carrying radio waves. We have one question here, and then I think we'll move to the I'd just like to thank very much.
introduced Dr. Carla for this excellent presentation. It's obviously very stimulating. We're, we, we're just hugely disappointed that there's actually only two or three hours in the afternoon, so we, we have a, a very full programme. What we'd like to do now, perhaps, uh, perhaps we should thank Dr. Carla.